Well, if any of y'all have seen me before, you know what I'm going to talk about. The same thing I always talk about, which is political Islam. But I thought I would talk about it this time with what was going on in local politics and in our local school system. For those of you who don't know me, you're looking at one of America's most famous, actually at one time I was in the top 10 of racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobes in America. So, and that ain't easy. But we did it anyway. Now, the reason I'm called a racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe is what I do is I talk about what Muhammad said and did and what Allah says in the Quran. And for these, telling these stories is what gets me the benefit of being a racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe. And I'll put it to you that if you're not a racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe, you're not doing your political job. Well, local politics, recently when Ray asked me to talk, I said, I don't know what I want to talk about, but so what I decided to talk about was the first thing that popped up in front of me, which was we had another multicultural moment in the schools and education, which was Meg's school went to the 12th Avenue Mosque to receive their dose of moderate Islam. And uh, what I want to tell you is what happened, what didn't happen, and what should happen. All right, here's what did happen. Uh, the person who gave the lecture to the children from the school was a former Christian, now a convert to Islam. And she tells me that Muslims honor Jesus, they honor that this whole event is about critical thought, Abraham is the prophet of the Jews, Christians, and Islam, they honor all the prophets, and that the children in front of her were her brothers and sisters. Mary wore a hijab, Jesus will return and fight the Antichrist, jihad is an inner struggle, and that Islam is all about the free will and conservative politicians are haters. So you didn't know it, but you were being talked about down at the 12th Avenue Mosque. So this is what happened. Now what is wrong with this? I don't mind somebody standing there and saying this, but here's what did not happen. No one stood up and was able to ask her any questions or tell her, you call us your brothers and sisters, and yet there are 12 verses in the Quran which say that a kafir, a non-Muslim, is never the friend of a Muslim. How does this work out? So this is the kind of question that should be asked if this were all about critical thinking and critical learning. Now then, they would also, if they were trained well enough to ask questions, would find out that although a creature called Jesus is in the Quran, his name is Isa, and he is not the Jesus of the Gospels. But no one was able to ask this question, nor did the students even know to ask this question. Nor did they even know to ask the question, if Abraham is the father of your religion, how come the Abraham in the Quran is not the same as the Abraham in the Old Testament? Just a small question, perhaps. Now then, critical thought involves debate. You may, you may remember debates, I don't know. But anyway, debate is involved in critical thought. And sitting there listening to one side of an argument, not the other, is not what is called critical thought. Now then, let's talk about the jihad. That's the J word. They, she told them that jihad was the inner struggle and that all members of all religions have an inner struggle. Oh, to lose weight, to not lose their, temper, to lose their temper or something else. We all have things that we want to correct in our life and this is the inner struggle. But no one was able to ask her the question, if jihad is the inner struggle, how come in the hadith, which are the traditions of Muhammad, only 2% of the hadith involving jihad are about inner struggle, and 98% of the jihad traditions are about <coughs> killing kafirs. But no one was there to ask that question. And by the way, on the question of free will, there is a verse or two in the Quran which states that an individual has free will, but 98% roughly of it is everything is in Allah's hands. So if, if Allah is determining what I'm to say next in my sentence, where is my free will? Now then, who is going to, Islam succeeds by the method of not telling lies, but in telling half-truths. There is a similarity to Isa in the Quran with Jesus. It's just that he's not the same person. By the way, when Isa returns, as Jesus is supposed to return, Isa is going to kill the pig and break the cross. And those who do not convert to Islam will be sent straight to hell under his rulership. He'll get married, have children, and then die. And he prays behind Muhammad when the imams pray in front of Allah. So we don't get the full story. And I don't object to them telling a half story. What I object to is that no one was there to tell them the other half of the story. I'm not for suppression of speech. 
I'm just for having the whole speech talked about. Now then, this is part of a civilizational war, and I'll use this term in a precise definition. This is a war between our civilization has as its ultimate foundation two principles, an intellectual principle, critical thought, or debate and argument. The other principle is an ethical principle of a uniform ethical, unitary ethic. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Which others? All others. So, that is the, corner, the ethical cornerstone. And by the way, this ethical cornerstone uh, lets us have a form of government which is quite flexible and adaptable. When the Constitution was written, slaves were not able to vote. And as a matter of fact, slavery was permitted. But what has happened through the application of the Golden Rule is that blacks were freed from slavery. All slavery was prohibited. Because if you think about it, who here wants, you can put an ad for a slave in Craigslist, and who's going to respond to it? Nobody wants to be a slave. So the application of the Golden Rule to our Constitution as an ethical principle allows us to adapt and change. Always on the basis of, if I were a woman, would I want to vote? Yes, I would. Therefore, I think women should have a vote. This is an ethical principle. Islam teaches a different form of ethics, which is the Sharia ethics of dualism. That is, in a Sharia court, a kafir, a non-Muslim, cannot even appear and talk in front of the court. Is not allowed to bear witness. So if you're a kafir and you want to appear in a Sharia court, you have to find a Muslim who's willing to stand in your place. You actually pay him to be your witness, and you don't know if he'll testify as you'd like to or not. So our civilization is based on unitary ethics and critical thought. Islam is based on dualistic ethics, where how you're treated, it depends on who you are. And it depends not on critical thought, but authoritative thought. In Islamic civilization, no idea is allowed to contradict what is in the Quran and the Sharia. So therefore, this is two different civilizations. And they cannot coexist. All right, it just doesn't work. If, we're, if, we're to file, if knowledge is to be based on the Quran, why debate about it? That is, there's no room for critical thought and authoritative thought. There's no room for a golden rule and a, and a dualistic form of ethics. So this is a civilizational war that's being fought. And it is a civilizational war because Islam is the most brilliant politi poli political group you've ever met. They change headscarves into war. They change food, halal food. They change prayer whether it's in the street or in a mosque or a school, everything is adaptable for pushing against the kafir. Now then, this should not be a problem. The problem is not Islam. We are the problem. Because who was not there? For instance, when the, there are, the major carriers of our civilization are government, law enforcement, military, churches, and schools. All of these are failing. All of them are failing. They're not doing their job. Many of these children who went to the Meg's mosque have a church they go to, and they were not explained to them the true nature of Islam, because inside the churches there's been a decision, we just don't talk about that. It upsets people. So as a result, the church does not prepare children for what they experienced there was dawa, D-A-W-A. No church teaches the principles of dawa to its congregation. So therefore, children are secretly joining Islam even in the schools because they were not prepared for what they were being told. These children should have been able to stand up and ask questions if they had gone to a church. That's just what I think. But they are not told to do that at church. Now let's talk about, um, and I call the pastors of most churches being professionally ignorant. They're not just amateur at ignorance. You can read Yahoo News and learn more about Islam than the average pastor will tell you that he knows. Now then, here's a story from uh, what happened in Tennessee at Vanderbilt University to reflect what the churches is, are doing or not doing. I remember this was a, an event by the Muslim Student Association and they brought in an FBI counterterrorism expert. We'll deal more with that in a moment. They also stood and said in front of the audience, the head of the MSA, Muslim Student Association, said, we have won in Tennessee. All the churches, including the fundamentalist churches, now accept Islam as a form of religion. So the Muslims are telling their own, we've defeated the church in Middle Tennessee. Now then, in this counterterrorism expert, let's talk about what law enforcement is doing and not doing. Let me explain a little bit to you about how the counterterrorism aspect of law enforcement was done in the FBI. 
After 9-11, George Bush said to the FBI, we want 10% of the FBI agents to be put in a new counterterrorism unit. Now then, let's say that you're an agent in charge in Chattanooga. You have agents working under you. FBI agents are difficult to fire and get rid of because they're civil service protected. But now then, you have a way to get rid of the bottom 10% of all your law enforcement agencies in the FBI. So this is the cold hard truth of what happens to the counterterrorism. Does it seem sensical? Of course it does. Now then, at this same MSA event, there was a, a, someone who stood up and asked this counterterrorism expert, says, have you ever read the Hadith? No, didn't know what it was. Have you ever read the Quran? Well, I've had an imam explain some verses to me. So this is what we have in this one Muslim Student Association meeting is we have an FBI agent saying, I don't know, but I'm an expert. And we have the Muslims bragging about the fact that they have defeated the churches in Middle Tennessee. And you know what? I don't think they're bragging. Here's another thing about the churches. I, Bobby Petray taught me how to do lobbying down at the legislature. You ought to tag along behind her for a while. When she moved, was awake. So anyway, she taught me how to do lobbying, and so I tried, I said, you know what? I want a resolution to come out of the Tennessee legislature condemning the persecution of Christians in Islamic countries. So I went to a, an, a, a, a legislator who was favorable to the cause, gave her my idea, and, she, and I wrote it up for her, and she says, this is great. This will be easy to pass. Well, there was one thing that was not easy to pass, and that was Turkey was mentioned as a persecutor of the Christian. And there was a big pushback from the legislators about naming Turkey. You see, the Turkish Chamber of Commerce has a heavy influence down at the legislature. Now then, here's what I did not do. I did not go out into the collection of pastors or anything and say, can you help push on the legislators so that we can include Turkey because they kill the Armenian Christians. I didn't even bother thinking about that. Why? Because it's useless to do. So therefore, I just said, take Turkey out. So this is an example of what's going on because the churches are not properly trained. And by the way, there is a story down at the legislature. My little books, which I sell in the back of the room, are little because of being down at the legislature. We were trying to pass a bill that was about Sharia law. And I realized in listening to the senators that they had too much to read. So when I got through with the thing, I went home to call my printer, I says, how many pages are in one eighth of one inch? 62 pages. So I wrote a 62 page Sharia law book. I've sold tens of thousands of them. So when you get down to the legislature, you can learn a lot too that can be very useful to you. And as a consequence, I took all my big books and made little books out of them as well. They outsell them 10 and 20 to one. So it was not a total loss for me. But do you understand what I'm telling you, that I wouldn't even try to go out and raise the pastor's trouble about a resolution talking about condemning, persecuting of Christians. I wouldn't even think about doing that. Why bother? They don't want to get involved. Do Muslims want to get involved? Oh, yes, they do. Big time. Now then, this was a school event. What should the schools actually be teaching? You're going to be surprised when I tell you, I think the schools should teach Quran, Sirah, Hadith, and Sharia. Straight up. You don't, need to, you don't even need to comment about it. When you read Surah 424 and it says that a Muslim can beat his wife, you know, you really don't need to do a lot of explanation in that. And I think that every child should know that that is possible to do. So I am not for suppression of speech. I am for all-out speech, including let's read the Quran and see what's in it. You can read for yourself that 12 verses say that a Muslim is never your true friend. We don't need to comment about that. Just teach the actual facts. 60 million Christians have died, and yet when you go to a church school, you won't learn anything about it. And by the way, it's true to my knowledge of all church schools. Speaking of schools, I did a little research project for a senator. And my research project was to find out how Islam was being teached, teached, I can do better than that, was being taught in our school system. I was surprised at the insolence and arrogance of the universities in dealing with a senator. They were like, what do you want this catalog for? Who's doing this? Why should we give you one? Who is this? This was a senator. So when the, the gentleman who was here earlier, I don't see him now, when he talks about the fact that UT is not under the control of the legislature, it is not. To my knowledge, no one is controlling our state universities. Think about that. And I think that is a, our own problem as well. I talked to a Vanderbilt professor who teaches Sharia law. 
<clears throat> she doesn't know Hadith from Haggis. <laughs> no, she doesn't. She said so. She was simply a law professor, and the head of the department says, you're going to be teaching Sharia law. I says, well, that's interesting. So you teach Sharia law, but you don't teach Quran, you don't teach Syria, you don't teach Hadith. No. I says, what do you teach about jihad? She says, oh, we don't teach about that. I says, what do you teach about women's rights? We don't teach about that. I said, what do you teach? She says, wills and business law. So this is from Vanderbilt University. This is what's being taught there. What I would like to see is that the state schools would teach the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith if private schools won't do it. Then, as we have here, Jackie can tell you more about this than I can, the textbooks in Tennessee now do not reflect our civilization, but they reflect the civilization of Islam. Right, Jackie? Who did this? We did it to ourselves in the sense that when you look, notice something about Islam and how brilliant it is. The Muslims don't do the actual work. We do the work for them. The textbook company was owned by Kafirs. Its money went to Kafirs. Everyone, Kafir is a non-Muslim. And yet here they are hiring an imam to vet everything that they do. So Islam is not the problem. We are the problem. I just keep coming back to that. We're getting the short end of a stick because we don't even grab the stick. Now I want to say something about home schools and private schools. They're a bad idea for the civilization. They're a good idea for your family, but they're a bad idea for the civilization. Because those who are powerful enough and wealthy enough to put their children in their own school, then just sort of say bye-bye to the school system. So as a result, those who could be politically and powerful and influence the school system are saying, nope, we're taking our children out of it. Now this is the best decision for your family, but it's a bad decision for the civilization because it's a fortress kind of concept. Instead of controlling all the territory, we just put up a wall and say, well, we control what's in this wall. That wall will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now then, let me tell you what's something about the media that affects me. Right now, I'm a presence on the web. My idea in doing my business, and by the way, if I'm going to deal with Islam, I have to have a source of money. I'm not paid with taxes. If I'm going to get money, it comes from this. So what I did was I started myself a business on books. The idea was is that the web would be a place in which I would try to put in newsletters, I would do videos, it was a level playing field and I could succeed, and I did. I created a quite profitable text, little book company, not a textbook company, although I do view them as textbooks. Not so much anymore. You know why? Let me tell you what's happening on the web. I invented the term political Islam. And if you put in Google, the actual search engine Google, it used to be six months ago that I owned the top three screens. I owned it all. It was all my turf. Not so much anymore. Two thirds of those are gone. Anything I'm paranoid? Well, of course, I'm paranoid, but there's another issue, which is Google has stated as a matter of corporate policy that they will suppress those who criticize Islam and elevate those who praise Islam. So therefore, a corporate policy is the playing field is not level anymore. I used to get about 1,000 new members of Twitter every month, now 300. I post on Facebook, and now then I get a peculiar kind of phone call and email from people. Bill, how come you're not putting out a new video every two weeks? Oh, I am. Oh, well, I'm a follower of yours on YouTube and Facebook, and I don't get notified. So what they're doing is they're not banning me, they're just cutting off the oxygen. Facebook, Twitter, Google, all of them have entered in. Now, it's not just me in particular. It's anybody who's on the Southern Poverty Law Center's handbook of hater, bigot, Islamophobes. Because the Southern Poverty Law Center has a different concept now. Their first concept was, we'll shame these people, put them on a list. And so it used to be when I was on the Southern Poverty Law Center, it was like finding my name on a truck stop, say, for a good time called Bill. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now then, the Southern Poverty Law Center has a new idea. Let's drive these bigots out of business. And so they've gone to the uh, Silicon Valley megatrons, mega, me mega manias, and they've said, Let's put these guys out of business. So I'm not the only one who's getting bad calls on the web. So as a result, I now have to look at another way of selling my books. 
Let's talk about the military. Jim and I mentioned the dirty word in the military now, because the military is supposed to defend us, right? The dirty word, McMaster. Our military does not study the history of jihad. West Point and Annapolis do not teach the history of jihad. They don't teach the major jihad writers. They should, because you'll find some interesting things to learn. A general in the military, and that includes the Islamic State, sees all combat as virtually civilizational war and a religious war, and that the critical thing is to destroy the enemy's faith. Let's go back to what I was saying about the churches. They, the churches have committed suicide on their own faith. They're lukewarm. They're neither hot nor cold. And in Islam, that is the first place to try to take down a civilization is in its religion. But the military doesn't study this. The military studies kinetic war, bullets and bombs. Got nothing against bullets and bombs, but there are other forms of fighting wars. And if all your military is capable of doing is fighting with bullets and bombs, they're going to lose because the enemy is going to defeat them in another method. General Stanley McChrystal, who was for a while under Obama was his top man for Afghanistan, wrote up an entire paper on how to defeat, Islam, how to win in Afghanistan, I think that was the title. That was heavily redacted for tactical purposes. That is, personal names were taken out. There were three words that did not occur in this document. Those three words are Islam, Jihad, and Muslim. <laughs> you're going to defeat an enemy in the longest lasting war we've had, and you're never going to mention those three words. This is not to demean McMaster, I mean, not McMaster, Stanley McChrystal. He probably has never been told about this himself. Or if he knows about it, he knows he can't talk about it. So the military is not doing a good job either. As a matter of fact, the only people who are doing a good job in resisting Islam are rooms filled with people like yourself. Oh, another personal thing, by the way, is an attribute to who I am. There's been recently some talk about uh, one of the things that the FBI used to do is they used to train people. People like myself and Spencer would write position papers, white papers for the FBI. Then under, was it Bush or Obama? They were pretty much the same on this issue. I forget who it was. <laughs> No, 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 I mean, I hate to break that to you, but the first man who was fired from being in the military and knowing what Islam was was Steve Coughlin, and he was fired under Bush. So anyway, I think that law enforcement should know what Islam is. I think the military should know what Islam is. I think the churches should know what Islam is. I think the average citizens should know what Islam is. And if you do all these things, you'll be like me. You'll become a racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe. <laughs> now, by the way, I laugh at the concept but this is a very effective weapon. It keeps most people shut up. The average pastor does not want to be seen in print that he is an Islamophobe. Although he can't, no one can define that term for me. Can you? What is an Islamophobe? Somebody who's afraid of Islam. Me! <laughs> You're afraid of wife beating and jihad? Torturous death? Hmm, me too. Now then, I want to say a couple of things about myself because uh, I can't win this war. I go around to small groups, I go to Europe and I give talks like this, some better, some worse. I can't do this. I mean, who else is beating the bushes on Islam here in Tennessee? Well, there's Kathy Henners, and me much, and you, and Jim, maybe a half a dozen people, but we cannot possibly win this war. Because you see, we're just irritants. So we have to have a way of bringing in groups. And that's the reason I'm saying that, in particular, the churches should become our most powerful weapon. Hey, winning feels good. I recommend it. But the idea of becoming a racist, hater, bigot will suppress most people's opinions. They'll just shut up because they don't want to be called that. Now let me give you a little good news because everything I've told you here is bad news. And the reason I tell you nothing but bad news is I do not know any good news about Islam in America. I mean, I had some hope when uh, Trump won, but he's turned out to be not so good on the subject other than putting off an occasional irritating tweet. But he chose McMaster to be charge of uh, basically, what is it, intelligence? What is McMaster's actual rank? National security, advisor. national security Advisor. When your National Security Advisor thinks that there's good Muslims and bad Muslims and that Islamic State are not really Muslims, you're not going to go anywhere. The good news is this. I have an organization in Europe, and there's several attributes it has which this group does not. It's called Center for the Study of Political Islam International, and it's centered in Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, and Austria. 
and Germany now. When I talk to them, the room looks very different. They're all under the age of 35. All of them. I'm the oldest man in the room. I usually am the oldest man in the room anyway, but in this case, I'm by far the oldest man in the room. And so I was curious, why is it that in Central Europe, they oppose Islam? Why is it that Orban, who's the head of Hungary, will say, we do not want any migrants, we don't need them? How come they tell the truth in Central Europe? We see Central Europe remembers something called the Soviet Union. They were under the boot heel of the Soviet Union, and the group in Bruno, Czech, one man told me the story of how his father could not go to college because he was a merchant under the Soviets. Another man told me how his uncle was killed by the KGB. As they said, we know tyranny. We have seen tyranny, we remember tyranny. And Islam is tyranny with a god. So there is hope. What's happening is, is they're translating my books into foreign, my books like Sharia law for non-Muslims have been translated into 20 languages now. They're being translated and also we have influence there with political parties. Not fringe elements like this meeting at a fairground, but meeting in legislative plazas. I gave a talk to the AFD, which is the, now the third ranking party in Germany, to the executive committee and the title of the talk was Using Proper Language. And I gave them a talk on how to not, how to talk, not about Muslims, but about Islam, political Islam, not religious Islam, how to talk about the principles of Islam and its political principles. When the talk was over, one of the members came up and said to me, I can now see after your talk we will never defeat Islam using our methods and that the only method will work are yours. Now this isn't a personal attaboy, it's just that I was the first person to ever talk to him and knew anything about Islam and using the proper words. So there are freedom parties now which are rising in Europe, in France, Germany, Austria, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Romania. So what I'm saying is, in Europe, it's different, because there the threat is, ah! It is in your face. It is interesting to walk along and see a bunch of women pushing strollers with a black bag on. It's demoralizing. And now then, Austria has made it illegal to wear the niqab. So we find that where people are closer to the edge, work is being done. And so I think what's happening in America is like, huh, they're, they're not here yet. Okay, well, I'll attend to that later. I'm going on a diet after Christmas. I'm going to start smoking, I'm going to stop smoking in the fall. So our dealing with Islam has this quality to it now. 